All right, welcome everyone to our October Higher Education Tableau User Group meeting. I do believe that Roshi's already put the invitation to Slack in the chat box. We can post that again for anyone who has not already joined. Today, we're going to open the floor for announcements for any um, job postings or just interesting going on that you want to share with the community, followed by our media community member this month, Patricia Siavalek. Siavarelli, am I saying that right? That's perfect, thank you. Awesome, yes. And then our trick, sorry, tip or trick or treat, cannot say that right the first time, tip or trick or treat, lightning round of tip sessions followed by a wrap up and chat. So um, any announcements that anyone would like to share, you can come off mute, you can share them in the chat, you can, post them on our Slack group open positions page if you have a job posting that you want to get out into the uh, community. Nothing today, okay. Well, in that case, we will not delay in getting started. And um, if you're joining us now and didn't see my chat earlier, feel free to use a fun video filter to dress up for the occasion. I am a pirate. Um, this is a throwback to when I worked in uh, Starbucks and we all had different pirate personas that uh, we'd like to um, just play around with from time to time. So that's, a, that's just a personal note about me. All right, so shall we get started? We're going to meet our community member. And Patricia, um, I do believe we have some links to share in the chat box with everyone. Patricia is our senior research analyst from Pratt Institute. Let me. Sorry, I lost my HE Tug page with your bio. Let me reopen that. It's okay, you have me here. All right, so since childhood, Patricia has been enthralled with computers and teaching, and she even lined up her stuffed animals on the bed to teach them spelling words. I hope you had a spelling bee and nobody lost. So during her 31 year career in education, 25 of which have been at Pratt, she has served as a registrar, manager of systems integrations, and a senior research analyst. Uh, she came to Tableau kicking and screaming, but it has grown on her over the years. Her favorite things are her husband, mom, nephews, an Italian greyhound. Uh, could you pronounce her name for me? You're on mute. Giacomo is my greyhound, yeah. Giacomo. I didn't want to uh, mispronounce that either. Right, so Patricia loves music, movies, and cooking, which she learned to do during the pandemic. I, as well, enjoyed some online cooking classes during the pandemic. That was my new thing. Um, as well as working out puzzles and collaborating on projects at work. So, Patricia, are you ready for our little one-on-one -on -one interview? Uh, I'm as ready as I'm going to be. <laughs> Great. So first, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and describe your role and your team? Uh, so our team in uh, institutional research is currently three people. We've gotten uh, funding, I think, this year to hire an additional uh, person, but that's not um, all set in stone just yet. And uh, basically, um, our growth mirrors much of Pratt, which is that it's very siloed and everyone has their own um, lane and they pretty much stay in it. And we got this new uh, supervisor in 2018, who's like, we're all one big team. Let's all put our hands in the same files. And the rest of us were like, what? Are you kidding? <laughs> so um, it's it's been uh, quite an interesting uh, growth experience for those of us who are not used to collaborating or editing other people's files, except as suggestions. Um, to actually muck around in other people's stuff. And it's been a bit of a um, learning curve for my supervisor, Osundwa, to um, realize that there are still offices in the world that work this way. <laughs> so it's been fun, but we're, we're growing, we're moving, we're changing. 
um, we're moving more into analyzing, and in his case, more so than mine, pr predicting uh, than just reporting. Um, so uh, that's been an interesting shift uh, for our current group. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, what type of data do you work with? Um, historically, uh, having been the registrar and having uh, participated in the registrar's office and in IT and in data conversions and stuff, I'm pretty much an expert on our student information system, which is a colleague from Lucian. And um, I cut my teeth in the computer world on a Unidata database. So when we moved over to um, SAP Business Objects in 2007 and started using SQL, it was sort of, um, it, was a, it was a major culture shift for me to start seeing all this data organized very differently from what I was used to. Um, and now uh, in the last couple of years, in addition to managing the ETL for um, colleague data and managing the business objects instance that we have on campus, I also manage the survey software. So course evaluations and other general surveys. And I'm working with someone in IT to build an API to draw down all the data from our surveys into a database so that we can access it more easily and in a better format for Tableau Prep and Tableau. Um, and uh, so I'm evaluating internal and external surveys. I'm analyzing um, data that we've reported externally for iPads and New York State uh, reporting and, and stuff like that. And uh, I'm also um, managing all the ETLs and data models for people who, at Pratt who are reporting through business objects. Sounds like you wear a lot of hats. So how Yeah, they're you, all a little askew, but yeah. <laughs> how do you use Tableau at work? Uh, primarily, my role in uh, the Tableau data has been um, developing a few simple, um, because I'm not the, the biggest, I see people who do these amazing visualizations and they're so super creative. And I'm like, well, I do bar graphs and line graphs, mostly bar graphs. <laughs> um, so I've done a few uh, visualizations on uh, completions and graduation and retention rates over time. Um, and right now I have a graduate assistant turned OPT student, which for those of you that don't have a lot of international kids, um, once they graduate from their degree program, they can work in the US, depending on their program area for about a year to three years. So I have her as a part-time assistant, 20 hours a week. And uh, we collaborate a lot on survey data. Right now we're working on a visualization for Nessie data that we just finished. Um, we're participating in SNAP right now. Uh, so that'll be coming down the pike next spring. Uh, and that's a, a graduation survey or a a post-graduation survey for 25 years worth of alums in arts area. Uh, we just did SERP last year. So as soon as we're done with Nessie, we'll be heading into SERP and analyzing some of that. So. Um, Very busy. Yeah. I, I just started working on an Nessie dashboard too. Maybe we should compare notes. Absolutely. I would like that. So what um, is your favorite Tableau project you've worked on? The ones that are already finished. Um, no, uh, <laughs> actually, you know, the, the Nessie project that we're working on right now is, um, and, I, and I have to be 100% upfront with all of you. I have a lot of ideas about how to present data and I'm good at working with the person who assists me on uh, pointing and saying, I think a level of detail calculation there would work really well. And I look it up and I say something like this, and then she actually does it. Um, because she's really quick inside of Tableau. I'm better at Tableau prep. Um, but the, the most recent one that we're working on right now for Nessie is taking into account a lot of the stuff that I've learned from all the different user groups that I attend um, and uh, or watch afterwards. Um, so we have uh, a Figma background that we've overlaid some data on and we're swapping the visualizations with what look like buttons at the top and um, 
So it's it's sort of a couple of dashboards, but it doesn't look like the page is changing at all. And, and so it's very crafty and it's very good. And we also uh, took a, a Steve Wexler uh, diverging Gantt chart um, so that we're doing sort of negative and positive uh, on the zero axis axis, excuse me. And um, then we have a circle that's representing the average score for the questions. So I'm really liking that. Um, and so on this, each dashboard we do is, or visualization is a lot more mature than the one previously. So on this one, we have a real cohesive um, organization. We're using the page space well. We're um, using all the Pratt colors. So it's not sort of, well, this page is orange and this page is brown. And this bar chart has 47 colors in it, but you know we're just we're really starting to take all the things that we've been learning incrementally that have sort of been pushed in a little bit at a time, and uh, and it's it's really coming out very accurate and very pretty. Excellent. Yeah. So, how long have you been using Tableau, and how did you learn it? Um. So as you said, um, I was asked to start using it in 2018 and I ignored it for a while. And then I actively pushed it away for a while. Um, and now I don't sort of kick and scream. I just whimper quietly in the corner and say, okay, okay. Um, and my, my path to Tableau has been circuitous in terms of actually buying into it. Um, I know I need to use it because it's what all the end users want to use. And I do see the value when things are laid out plainly and cleanly. Um, I do take issue with some visualizations that are just cool for coolness's sake. <laughs> um, and they really, they bug me. <laughs> um, but I, I, I appreciate the art that goes into them, honestly. Um, and in terms of learning, I tried a few different ways. I went to a couple of synchronous classes um, and I was too new at the time to sort of appreciate and have them stick. And then I did the e-learning, um, which is really great, but as a really busy staff person, I didn't have a tremendous amount of time to devote to it. So I won't say I wasted it, but I could have gotten further if I'd had more time. And what I find has been the really most useful way for me to learn Tableau is to just sign up for as many virtual user groups as possible. And the ones that I can attend and pay attention while they're happening and actually ask questions, it's great. But even if I can't, or even if I did, I collect all the videos. And when I go to the gym in the morning, I watch them when I'm at the gym. And I watch some of them I watch over and over again. And some of the same people present multiple times with slight variations on what they've done. And over time, things are sinking in and sticking. And um, I'm also, I, re I know when something's stuck because I explain it to somebody else and I'm like, oh, I didn't even realize I knew that. Okay, that's good. <laughs> um, or I see somebody doing something in another tool and I'll say, oh, that's just like, you know, level of detail calculations in Tableau, or that's just like, you know, this or that. Um, or I think you can put a link there and wouldn't that work better? Um, and so it, it's it's getting there. It's getting there. So this, this old dog has a few new tricks left Excellent. in there. So what's your favorite Tableau feature? Um, I think the, uh, what do I, it was my best Tableau feature. I think the custom color palettes have been the, the thing that I really enjoyed using the most. I was really excited when I saw all the Tableau palettes out there and I was like, well, that's really cool. But then it gets very overwhelming after a while. And the fact that I was able to make several palettes, one that's just Pratt Black and one that's just Pratt Gold and one that's got the three primaries and one that's got our expanded palette so that I could limit my views to the particular color or set of colors that I wanted to use. For example, one thing that we're trying to do over time is build in multiple years with a year drop down, like either look at the summary of all years or look at a particular year at any particular time. And when you're doing 
for example, a map with locations of where your graduates have been employed and you roll a new year in that has a new country, if you haven't limited your palette, all of a sudden you get this big white dot that appears in the middle of this sea of black dots and you're like, whoa, no. And uh, originally we used to go into the color and go tick, 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 tick and change them all to black. But if you make that particular page or that particular um, table have only the black or marks card, excuse me, um, have only the black palette, then you're safe because it'll never change and it's good. So I've I found that to be really useful once I realized I could make those custom palettes. And what would you like to learn more about in Tableau? Um, as the person who manages the data that goes into Tableau for a number of people, in addition to managing Tableau for myself, uh, we use Tableau Cloud. We don't use Tableau um, Server. Um, and one thing that I need to do is I need to develop a better strategy for drawing data down from a number of different sources, be it survey results or survey and demographic combinations or data from business objects that's sort of pre-digested, not straight out of the database, which is really ugly and messy. Um, I need to get a better long-term organized strategy for feeding data into the Tableau Cloud repository of data so that it's available on a regular basis and updated and consistent uh, for people to use. So that's, I'm all about clean, easy to understand data. So that's, that's where I'm at. Definitely. What is one thing you wish you could go back in time and tell yourself as a Tableau newbie? I would have gotten involved in the user groups much sooner. Um, and much, I would have just jumped in with both feet because the thing that I've really found, um, Roshni, Ginny, um, everybody here, I'm on the Florida Tableau user group, you know, Orlando, I'm on, oh, analytics, data prep, I'm on uh, data plus women. I just, I love all the people and I love how they share and I love how Tableau supports all of you in sharing. Um, and um, I, I've learned more from individual people and from being on the Slack groups and communicating with people one-on-one -on -one as issues arise uh, than anything else. And I would have, I would tell myself to go do that right away, do it sooner. Yeah. Good advice. Yeah. Do you use Tableau outside of work? And if so, how? I don't. Um, I'm not a person who does a whole lot of computer stuff outside of work. Um, I, I, this sounds very sad in some ways, but it's always been who I am. I'm not somebody who like surfs the web for hours on end or, you know, goes out and builds extra things. For a while, I was planning to do a, a book club uh, tableau visualization for public so that I could practice some things but I just never have time to get the data together. For me, it's much more relaxing to spend a half hour, an hour on the weekend while I'm sitting outside and actually get some work done <laughs> and get some emails done. So that way during the week, I have a little more breathing room. So uh, I find that much more relaxing than trying to work on some uh, data set that I would have to build from scratch. Um, so I, yeah, I don't, I, I'm very impressed by the people that do, but no, I don't. Was there anything else you want to share before we start the lightning round? Um, I would say that it's not exactly Halloween based, but resistance is futile. Um, Tableau is to most other reporting tools what um, Word and Excel Hi, were to Welcome Lotus to and Word Perfect. So I, um, you know, I think you got to give it a try. It's not so bad. And just always make sure to check your data and your results, at least in a couple of spots manually and have a couple of people look at it before you publish it. So you don't go, wait, eight plus eight plus 12 is not 15. That's, wait, something's wrong. Because it, it happens. It just, it happens all the time. The calculations go crazy. And sometimes you have to backtrack a little bit to figure out why. Yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah. 
All right, well then, without any further ado, let's start our lightning round. To kick us off, who is your favorite Pratt alumni? Betsy Johnson, the designer, or Rob Zombie, the musician? So my sister will kill me for saying Rob Zombie because she's a fashion designer who also graduated from Pratt, but I, I'll say Rob Zombie. Well, maybe hey, your sister can I, is can I interrupt with a Well, my sister, sure, but my favorite famous one that I have to choose from in this meeting is Rob Zombie. Can I ask a, a quick question about Rob Zombie? What, what, is, what are your thoughts on the, uh, the Munsters movie that he is, has, whatever, directed? Um, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, I, some of his stuff is really good and some of his stuff is a little over the top frightening. So we'll see. All right. Fair, yeah. fair, fair answer. <laughs> Which brings us to the next, uh, do you prefer the Munsters family or the Adams family? Oh, definitely the Munsters. That and... is the correct choice. Always the correct <laughs> choice. What is your favorite New York bureau? Queens, totally Queens. That's where I'm from originally. Um, I lived right by LaGuardia Airport, the Tennis Center, Shea Stadium, now City Field. Um, it's the most diverse and the biggest uh, borough, and it's, it's just awesome. And for those of us unfamiliar with New York, which, which color was that on the map? Red. Red, okay. And you see where that big dip is in the top? Uh-huh. Yeah, on the, at the bottom, at the very bottom point of it is where the tennis center and uh, city field is. And the tiny little bump to the right of that is where LaGuardia Airport is. And um, I lived right north of there. And that big long uh, strip at the bottom, which is uh, Rockaway Beach and, and all of that stuff at the far right of that is where JFK is. All right. Yeah. That's a geography lesson. Yeah. All right. Uh, what is your favorite Boolean operator? Well, I do like peanut butter and jelly, but my favorite Boolean operator is not. So. What is your favorite Halloween themed movie? Uh, well, sort of two of them. My favorite not scary one is Nightmare Before Christmas. And my favorite super scary one is the very first Nightmare on Elm Street. Gave me nightmares for weeks and I couldn't stop watching it. <laughs> uh, what Fortunately, is... only one of them is on here, so. <laughs> okay. Uh, what is the weirdest way someone has mispronounced your name? Okay. There are no words to describe the pain of going from a very simple uh, Italian last name that is akin to Smith. My original last name was Rossi that I was born with. And to go to this 10 digit name as an 80s child who wanted to hyphenate and be totally, you know, modern. It, there's just not enough space to put it on anything. And so uh, depending on the person who's Italian, who's trying to tell you that you're not saying your name wrong, it could be Chiavarelli, it could be Ciavarelli, it could be Chiavarelli. And then mostly you just get weird stares as people look at your name and they go, are you Patricia? Uh, uh. And you go, yeah, that's me. That's me. So it's, um, it, as long as you try, that's all I can ask. It's not a very common name, even in Italian. So it's, uh, it's not the easiest one. Well, this is a very fun dashboard. If anybody wants the link, I highly recommend going and playing around with it. Uh, next up, who is your favorite New York City based superhero? And bonus points if you would wear it for a Halloween costume. No bonus points for me because it's Spider Man and it's, it's way too tight. <laughs> <laughs> but and last. Uh, but Peter Not Parker's me. from Queens, so yeah, it has to be him. That's awesome. <laughs> Last but not least, what is your favorite Halloween candy and why is it candy corn? It's totally candy corn because I can eat it until I get sick and still eat more. We are of the unpopular opinion because I love it too. I, it's, I can only bring one or two bags out into the house per year. And so we went shopping last week and I said, oh, there's the candy corn. I said, get it. And we can't get any more. 
because I will just, <laughs> I'll eat it until I feel ill and I'll keep going. I don't know why it's got some kind of addictive chemical, but I have to. <laughs> oh gosh. And see, now we have started a, a debate among our, our tug viewers. Well, yeah, there's a so whole much. hashtag war <laughs> happening right now. Oh, is there really? Yeah. Yep. Check out the chat. Throw Thank you away. so much, Patricia. Anything but candy corn. There you go. Just send it. I'll give. I'll put my address in there. You can just send it there to me. There you go. There yeah. you go. She'll take it off your hands. Thank you so much for being our Muta community member for October. Our plan is to have one of these every month. So if anyone else is interested in volunteering, we are booking into next year. So go ahead and send us your name and info. Thank you for having me. All right, so we're gonna roll right into our tip or trick or treat. If anyone can say that five times fast, I will, I don't, I don't know, get you a bag of candy corn. Um, so how is this gonna work? It's basically gonna be a lightning round, but we're gonna maybe not go so fast. Um, says the, the person who was talking like a speed demon. Um, so a bunch of HE Touch members are gonna present a bunch of tips and tricks and everyone who presents is gonna get some ghoulish tableau swag, the treats. Um, so Ginny, you wanna take it away with the first intro? I will. So Christina Sheridan is going to do our first tip or trick or treat. Christina is an institutional research specialist at Rollins College. She loves playing with data and she's involved with data governance, DEI, global initiatives and service excellence at her institution. While she's been in higher education for many years, her first exposure to institutional research was just in March of 2020 as a research data analyst at Ohio Northern University. And while she thinks Tableau is awesome, she's relatively new to Tableau, and she found this trick to remove columns using custom query entirely by accident after researching what methods are there to accomplish that. So, Christina, take it away and share this trick with us. Thank you, Jeannie. How is everyone? I hope everyone is doing well. I would like to give a shout out, shout out to my team, which is as awesome as Tableau is and as awesome as this community is. And let me share my screen with you. I would also like to ask you, do you know what's behind this mask? that I have. It's a witch that's going to show you a magic trick. And because that witch has been so excited about this, hasn't slept much last night, so maybe a few magical mistakes will be on the way as well. Thank you. So I will show you how to remove columns that you don't need. You may have, you may connect to a server and you may connect to a table that has multiple columns, like you may have a hundred or more columns. You reduce that to only the ones that you need, at least the ones that you think you need. And here on the left, you can connect, I normally connect to Oracle or Microsoft SQL Server to our data warehouse or to Oracle to Banner, if you are a Banner school. But for this demonstration, I have some dummy data in Microsoft Access, so I'm going to connect here. At this point, if you would connect to your Microsoft SQL Server or Banner, you would need to enter your credentials such as server and database and so forth, username and password. But it, for the way I set it up, I don't have to do that. And once I'm in here, this is the table that the dummy data table that I have. And what I can do is I can either go in here and go to convert to custom SQL, or I can go in here and convert to custom SQL. And what this is, this is not something that I created. This is automatically created in Tableau from the table, from the fields that that table has. So say if you connect to Banner to say um, SHR DGMR or whatever table you're using there, it's gonna show all the fields in that table and automatically it's gonna be created like this. Now, I have a lot of columns in here. So I'm going to cancel this for a bit. I have a lot of columns here. As you see, there are 101 columns. 
And I have only 10 rows, but that could be a lot of rows. But I have a lot of columns here, and I can show you quickly. I have Halloween columns. I have column, just columns, and I have some Black Kitty columns as well at the end. See Black Kitty and then some more columns. So say that I just, I just want to keep the Halloween and the Black Kitty columns, not the other generic columns. So what I will do is I go in here. As I was showing you before, I might expand this a little. Okay, so say that I just want to keep this, the black kitty once, and I want to delete all the column ones. So then I all I do is delete those. But what I normally do is first I make a copy of that just in case I change my mind and I want to return one of the columns to the query. So I copy all of it. Put it back here on, on my right. I have a notepad, so I'm going to show it to you quickly. But I have it on my right here with all those columns, just in case I change my mind. So now I'm going to delete quickly the ones that I don't want. So let's say I don't want this one. I don't want this one. I don't want any of the columns. Okay, and I only want the Halloween and the Black Kitty. So let's delete those. So notice I'm only left with those. So now I click OK. And here you go. Now if you look over here, notice only 21 fields left, not the 101 they were originally. And notice over here I only have the Black Kitty and the Halloween columns. Now I might say, well, I might want to now, I say, oh, I actually don't need the Halloween 3, um, like, a field. So I don't need this one. I'm going to delete this one, too. So, OK. And notice Halloween 3 is gone. Now I can say, oh, my god, oh, no, I actually needed Halloween 3. So then I go back to my all my columns over here and copy that field, whatever the name may be in my case, I chose this one. But it may have a more complicated name that I may not want to bother, I may not remember, but I have the reference here and I put it back in here. There you go. And now Halloween 3 should be back here. All right. so. One other way, if you don't, I mean, what I normally do, once I decide what fields I actually need, I will save that, not only the original query with all the fields, but I also save my, I also save my customized query, just in case I want to use it later for some other purposes. So in that case, um, if I would start a new Tableau session, so say I'm done with this, I'm good with this, so if I close this and open another one, I'm going to say no for now because I don't really need it. But if I open a new one and I'm going to open another Tableau session, I can just I can just uh, Like in this case, I open a new Tableau session. I can just remove whatever. In this case, when you connect into a SQL server or a banner table, you're not going to have the table there. I'm just going to remove it to kind of show you what you would actually have. So then if I have my query saved, all I need to do is go here, double click, and then paste the query from my file. So for example, if Oh, I need to cancel now because I need to first copy it. So here's my, my, uh, my query. So say this is whatever query I wanted. Say I just want, um, actually, I'm going to copy the whole thing now. But whichever query I wanted, to, and even with just the ones with just, just the column that I wanted, I then go 
So copy and then go in here, double click, paste, and I can even, if I don't, if I want to keep the customized query the way I want it, I can just say, okay. But if I just want to customize some more, because again, this is the generic query, um, I can just delete whatever columns I don't want. And okay, and done. So, and I can rename this if I don't like the way it's called, because now it's called, if I reuse a customized query, it will be calling it a weird name and you don't want that. And that's that. And then you can edit it if you want, or you can rename it, edit it, and so forth. So that's my trick. And um, I find it particularly useful for me. Um, and you can always go back and add or remove columns as long as you save the original one, then you don't need to go back and search and see what field you would want to add. Thank you so much. I appreciate watching my magical trick. Thank you so much, Christina. That was great. You're very welcome. I had uh, no idea that that was a possibility and it looks like I'm not the only one. So we all learned a little something. All right, so I've got the next tip or trick or treat. I'm gonna steal the screen share from Roshni. All right, so I have actually have a few tips that I'd like to share with you. Uh, we'll start with tip number one, which has to do with Vizin tooltips. And I found this one on the Tableau forums when I ran into a problem I'd never encountered before. And so I thought I'd share it with you all. So here we have a graph and the graph is showing a term by term status of an entering cohort from their entry through the end of year nine. So if I hover over any of these bars, we're going to get a Vizin tooltip with additional information. So like this one says, of the 634 students whose first term was fall 2011, 448 or 70.7% had a status of enrolled in fall 2012, which is their one, uh, year one. And then we have the um, visit tooltip below that line, which is the table with entry term, count, status, and then subsequent term, count, and percent. Okay, so currently this tooltip is not very helpful. It only shows us the segment that we're hovering over. And in terms where you have a really tiny segment at the top, it can be hard to get your, your mouse to hover just right so you can read that. And also the uh, percentage is always saying 100%, which is not reflective of the bar that we're, we're trying to look at. So we go to the tooltip shelf. Um, we'll see that our Viz and tooltip is set with a filter equal to all fields. Now, if we wanna change this to only filter based on the entry term, and the number of terms since their first term, it's going to be a much more helpful tooltip. So let me just change this. Now we see that we have a filter for entry term and a second filter for number of terms since the first term. I'm gonna hit okay. And now we'll go back to our dashboard and I'm gonna hover over any of these. And I don't know if you caught what just happened, but when I hovered, it took my entry term filter, which was set to only showing fall, to showing all terms. So at first I thought, this is just a fluke. I'm just gonna go back in, I'm gonna select my fall terms. That's gonna fix the whole thing. Hit apply. And I go to hover again and it resets my entry filter again. So I didn't understand why this was happening. So I went to my tooltip and I see this action tooltip. And then I go in to look at this list and I notice that it is showing my entry term followed by a comma, followed by the number of terms since the first term. So obviously this has something to do with why my filter is not working correctly. So I went to the Tableau forums and I you know, searched for this issue and this is the solution that I found. First, it said to make a copy of the different 
fields that are causing the issue. So entry term and the number of terms since the first term are the two fields that I needed to make a copy of. And what I'm going to do is take this entry term and drop it in place of the entry term on rows and then take this number of terms since the first term and replace both of the pills on columns. Now I'm going to go back to my dashboard and I'm going to filter for the falls that I want to see. Hit apply. And now when I hover, not only does it not reset my entry term filter, but it still shows me all of the statuses in the Vizen tooltip table so I can compare the correct percentages for each bar. And if you do happen to go back to the tooltip, you'll see that when I change these pills by replacing them with the copy, it automatically updated these filters in my tooltip. All right, so that's tip number one. Now we're gonna go on to tip number two, which is another filter tip. And um, you'll see here we have a list of college abbreviations along with a count of students, how many are full-time, part-time, and then we have this null value. Well, let's just say we have a situation where we do not want this null value on our table and we don't want this null value showing up in our filter. So, if I hide this on the table and then set my filter to show only relevant values, which it already is, um, it doesn't go away. And so we had to come up with another solution for how to hide this null value on the filter. So I just made a copy of this full-time part-time field, leave the original filter in the filters box, but then add the copy. I'm gonna select full-time and part-time I'm going to leave null unselected. And the reason I'm doing that as opposed to just excluding it is just it has a better performance um, to include rather than exclude. And when I hit OK, my full time part time filter no longer shows the null options. And um, that's the end goal that I had in mind. So last tip of the day. Tip number three has nothing to do with filters, but I discovered it by accident a couple weeks ago, so I wanted to share it. Um, so here we have our list of college abbreviations again, and I made a copy of that field and went ahead and typed in aliases that spell out the full name of the college. So let's uh, say I wanna make a parameter out of this field. So if I right click on the version that has the alias names, and go to create parameter, you'll see that it automatically fills in the original abbreviation values and the display as is already populated with the aliases for each of those values that I already typed in. So I don't have to type them all in again. And those are my three tips of the day. And thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen. And I will introduce our next speaker. Hold on just a second. All right, so our next speaker today is Jungmi Park. She is from the University of Arizona. She works there as a data analyst with the Trellis team at the University of Arizona University Information Technology Systems, UITS. She has been using Tableau for about one year, and today she's going to give us a tip about how to pre-filter your data in Tableau Prep. All right, thank you. I'm gonna start the screen share. Um, this will stop others. Yeah, okay. So I will start with this. I'll do presenter view. Are you guys seeing the right screen? With, or are I believe you we are. Okay, great. So this is a tip or 
trick or treat, sorry. Um, I don't know how many of you are using Tableau Prep, but it sounds like many of you are. Um, this is something I discovered while trying to connect to a larger database. Um, so Trellis at the U of A is, is kind of like our Salesforce instance. So I have to connect to Salesforce to kind of um, extract a lot of data. And sometimes the data source or the tables I'm connecting to are so large, it takes about like 20 minutes, even longer to load all the data. And then I realized I could pre-filter. And one of the reasons you would pre-filter is um, to kind of save you time, to kind of speed up the process and to um, reduce the number of filtering steps you might have to do later on. You know, it's a lot easier when you the data is loaded to uh, filter, but one of the reasons you have to pre-filter is, is if that process takes too long. And how you pre-filter, yes? Jeremy, I'm gonna oh. stop you real quick. Um, it looks like we, can you click the swap, swap displays button? You're okay. seeing the- You're seeing the, dis um, the presenter? The, yeah. Interesting, okay. You know, this happens to me quite a lot when I do it worked. presentations. <laughs> it worked fine during tech check. I'm just telling everyone it worked completely fine during tech check. It was perfect. Okay, let's try again. All right. So if I do this and then share, if I do present review, what do you, okay. Now we see the right one. Thanks. Okay. And now do you still see the right one? Yep, we're good. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, it kind of reduces the number of filters you have to do later. So when you have um, your data loaded or connected to your um, your data source, then you see this filter values button. And how this works is like you end up writing a calculated field. And as many of you here have written calculated fields. No, there are just a couple of different ways to get to something um, when you're in Tableau desktop. However, when you're writing that pre-filtering um, step, it must be written in a Boolean statement. And I kind of learned that the hard way. If you do like an if else, name it this, define it as that, it won't work. So it has to be something like the year is, you know, the same as the year of today. So this is the last one would be to extract only data from like this year or um, something I was like a very specific project I was working on was we were looking at um, campaigns and how campaign members were added. And so like only for manual added. And then, so when it pops up, like I said, it looks just like a calculated field and you will be able to um, see it as valid, hopefully, hopefully it's valid, right? So the reason to pre-filter, sometimes you wanna subset the data to only values from this year. That could kind of speed things up. So if we use like um, a, a superstore example, you can layer it on. You could do a region and the date, so that you have both, you know, only values from the AMEA region, things that were ordered this year. And it, it can get kind of complicated. This was one that I wrote to get things from the last six months. You know, you can um, see it a little more. Oh, hold on. I'll... I'll share the Tableau desktop screen really quickly to show you how that would look. And it's my desktop one, share it. Okay, you're seeing probably the whole desktop. So when you do write a few, I sometimes I write it in two separate ones, even though I just said you could layer it, just so you could go back and change it or, or, or take one out. And when you have a filter such as like this for the time, um, and date truncation, you could see in your latter steps that, yeah, there are only things from the last six months. So you could do, you know, your quick checks here. And when you filter values here, you can kind of use those 
um, tips again to write another calculated field. So that was my kind of quick little tip on how to do that. Yeah, Booleans are wonderful, <laughs> but it was a little trickier for me to realize only Boolean statements for the pre-filter step. So. so there's a question in there uh, in the chat about why some of the calculations use double equal signs instead of single single equal side signs. Um, it looks oh. like we have one answer, um, but if you, yeah. if you have a reason for that, that you're that you're more comfortable using one or the other, um, feel free to share that. Yeah, it's more. Yeah, I've seen it in other common uh, programming languages, too. It's um, the double equals is to give it that identity because you could also see it as a exclamation point equals right to be like yeah not, so it's like not equal right yeah whereas like if you're giving it an equal just one equal you're sometimes using it to um especially in r you're using it to define like a new name or um rename something so right yeah. so so if you see it either way in tableau it at least right now, doesn't matter whether you use the single equals or double equals, but in other programming languages, you may see people carry over practices, um, basically, right? Yeah, and, and that's why writing um, the calculator fields in Tableau can be like quite tricky, because some of it is from the other languages, and some of that uh, convention, I should say, is still kept there. Yeah. yeah, one of the, you've got to not only translate what you want, from in your brain into Tableau, but you got to make sure you use the, the right format. All right. Thanks That's so much, Zhang Li. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're going to switch over to Becker. Um, Becker. Becker is from the University of Texas uh, at Austin, and he, form he manages the newly formed DataViz team um, in the Data to Insights Analytics group. Sounds so fancy. Um, and I do have to say it's at the University of Texas at Austin, not University of Texas. Austin, because apparently there's a difference. Um, he also co-leads the internal tug at the university, and he loves to play, play around with new Tableau features and find ways to use them in the dashboards that he and his team produces. So, uh, Becker, if you want to go ahead and take it away. Yeah, thank you very much, Ashwin. No problem. That is the screen I will be sharing. All right. Hey, everybody. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to go through. I didn't get the memo about tips and tricks or treats. So I just called this tips and tricks. Excuse me. Um, I hope you'll forgive me. But uh, yeah, I'm going to take you through a few of these um, uh, using the uh, hide and show uh, feature for um, containers. Now, the ones that I use the most are the ones that use um, or the one the hide and show for floating containers, but they're is a new feature, I, I think it goes back one or two versions in Tableau, a hide and show feature for fixed containers as well. We don't use the advanced, <laughs> we don't have that version of Tableau yet at UT. I mean, that's not the instance we use with the setup with the Tableau server and everything. So um, unfortunately, I don't use that in uh, our business dashboards all that much, although I have tried it in a couple of personal visits. So I have one tip from that and that'll be the last one that I can show you. So let's begin with the glossary dropdown. So I created a, a while back, I created a, a CDS dashboard where I wanted to have the CDS definitions accessible to users in a kind of really easy way right in the dashboard that they used. So right in the dashboard that they were using. So I went ahead and created this dropdown where they can kind of search for a term and get to the definition that they want within the dashboard. We're gonna go ahead and create that right now. So what you'll need is a spreadsheet with a column for the term you want uh, them to search on and the definition that you want to uh, uh, for that term. And then let's go ahead into a sheet and we'll put the, put it on the right data source. And we'll put terms onto columns and definition onto text. And uh, this will give you this long kind of container but then we'll go ahead and drag term onto filters as well and select all but one. Now you have only one term and definition uh, visible. You see that there's also a tooltip pre-programmed with a couple of, with some additional information in there. Um, and we'll go to a sheet. And once we have that sheet ready, we can drag a container onto the screen, press shift so it floats. Um, 
I'm going to go ahead and give that a white background with just a gray border. Oops, all the way around. And then drag that sheet that I created onto the workbook hide the title or into that container, hide the title and make the filter visible um, or make the term filter visible, visible rather. And then I'll go ahead and drag that into here, make that single select drop down. And now you see that they can kind of select uh, a term within that uh, uh, window, this to entire view. And now to create the cool hide and show button, you just go to the container, Click on hide, select hide and show, to make that a little bigger. And then I'll go in and edit this to make it that, um, to give it that glossary text. And we can go in here and select text button, put in glossary. And you can kind of format this however you like. I like creating a kind of black text on a um, gray background for when the uh, item is showing. So it looks like a button is pressed. And that means that when the item is hidden, you'd kind of go ahead and give it a white background. Um, and you press apply, and now you have this button that allows users to kind of click in and out of the uh, uh, this menu and search what they want to search for. And yeah, um, next tip will be A warning pop up, which I've used a couple of times. If you have something that you want users to be aware of in the dashboard you're using, you're giving them access to, but don't have time to kind of connect with IT and have them create something within, um, you know, the web interface, um, then you can just do it yourself. So what you'll do is just drag a vertical container into the view, drag a text box in here, and I have some pre-prepped text right here, of course. Kenny Loggins shout outs or references here. Um, once that's formatted, put that in the middle again, give this a white background with all the way around again, white graph, white graph background with uh, just a little border. And then I'm going to make this with the show hide button on top up again, make this a little bigger, go in and edit button. And we're going to keep it on the image button now. But I pre pre prepared a continue button just in PowerPoint, very easy to make. And once that is uh, selected, I can do apply. And now users have this button, which when they click on, makes that box disappear. Now you still have these three lines here. So to solve that, we're going to use a different kind of tricky element within Tableau, and that is a transparent image. So once you have the image selected for item hidden, the transparent image selected for item hidden, just click OK. And once a user clicks out of that, then they can't see anything. If they happen to click on the same exact area, it'll pop it up again. Um, but I mean, I haven't had that happen to me in a couple of cases I've used it, and it's for emergencies only in any case. The Third tip, and this is the one that I use the most across, I mean, this is something that we're uh, implementing in every single dashboard that my team produces is a user instruction overlay. Um, and the way we do it, I know that there are several different ways of doing it, but this is the one way that kind of I've uh, uh, settled on and creates good results for us. So um, what you'll need, and again, we'll go out of Tableau here, what you'll need is a screenshot or, or just a PowerPoint and then you take a screenshot of the dashboard you want to create an overlay for, bring that into PowerPoint. You create text boxes with arrows kind of pointing out the different functionalities that you want users to be aware of and different things to kind of uh, know that are there. Uh, create a shape the same size as that image and then go to um, shape fill and set it to no fill and no outline, and then you get this invisible shape and outline that you then select one of the text boxes, control A to select everything and save as picture. And what you get is this transparent image with an overlay of text boxes that you can then bring into Tableau. So let's do that now. Again, load a vertical container here. 
make it correct size. And then just drop this image picture or this image object onto here, load up that overlay fit and center, and then click OK. And then go back to the container and give it a gray background with a slightly darker gray border. And we make the background oh, uh, transparent, about 50%. So the users can see what's going on beneath it, of course. And you add a show, hut but show hide button. And you can do a couple of things with this. You could just leave it as is. It's fun fully functional. Um, you can make it text uh, and have it say, show overlay or show instructions or something like that. We actually have gone with, uh, uh, we cre I created a, an icon or a pair of icons that users know to look for in our dashboards and give it the sort of look of uh, something that's in they're interacting with. So once users want to select uh, or pop up that overlay, we'll just click on that question mark and it pops up and it's dynamic. So if the user performs some sort of action, Sorry, it's transparent. So once a user performs some sort of action and pops that overlay right up, up again, it's the underlying dashboard is still fully visible. Um, the last tip that I was mentioning with the fixed one, I won't go uh, into uh, at uh, very- If you wanna go, go ahead and, and do it in regular time, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, I actually, um, there's not much to show. So I just um, have created two bar charts here and this is, literally just um, CDS data. And you know we have the old tried and true method of parameter of swapping out sheets using a parameter. But if you only have two options where you wanna show or hide a graph based on, let's say if you wanna allow for deeper level of analysis for some breakdown uh, or allow uh, or a different dimension of breakdown. So what you would do is just create, um, well, this is set up with two charts. So there's this larger container and these are all fixed containers as you can see, this is tiled with a bunch of uh, different layers for the different containers. Um, so this is the larger one from the whole dashboard. This is a container that contains both of these um, charts, but within that container, we have a sub container, <laughs> lots of using a lot of using the word container a lot, a sub container that contains only the chart. And I set up a set uh, show hide button for this container, which is here. And users can just use this to kind of pop that chart in and out of the dashboard. So if there's a breakdown that you don't want to just kind of allow by default, but make users able to access if they want to kind of dive deeper, then you can do that without those uh, annoying parameters setups. And yeah, that's all. Great, thank you. So hi folks, I'm Jennifer Heaton from the University of Miami. And today I'm going to be talking about um, custom number formats. So you can use, use custom number formats to add text, special characters, symbols, um, to enhance your visuals and help tell a story with your data. Now, one of my favorite places to use custom number formatting is in bands. So um, I've put a few examples here using Tableau's super store, super store data. So the custom number formatting has been applied to the year over year change lines here at the bottom. So as you can see, this approach can add a lot of context to your data summary. So, so if we're looking at this order summary and we can see the total sales by using this custom number formatting in combination with calculated fields, we can see they've decreased from the previous year. But at the same time, we can also say, okay, well, sales have, have decreased, but what about our profits and our profit margins? So this has actually increased from the previous year. So um, I'm, I'm gonna show you how to, to add this in. So if we focus on this uh, year over year change portion of the band, you'll see that there's a downward facing triangle or a pyramid, and it's been added there as a symbol to indicate that there was a decrease in sales in comparison to the previous year. Now, it may not look like it from what you're from what you're looking at, but the year over year change text is also part of the formatting in this example. So to apply custom number formatting, you'll want to access the default properties for the measure. And you're going to do that by clicking on the measures drop down arrow, going to default properties, number format, 
and then finally custom. And here you're going to be able to access the um, the syntax where you can enter in the syntax. Now in the custom custom number formatting syntax, you can specify three formats, and those are separated by semicolons. So in the first position, you can specify a positive number formatting. In the second position, a negative number formatting. And in the third position, you can um, speci specify formatting for zero values. <clears throat> now in this um, example, using the Tableau Superstore data, um, I have wrapped, notice that I've wrapped this year over year change in a vertical bar and double quotes. And that's the text piece that we're adding to the formatting. And then this is followed by the upward facing triangle, a plus sign. And then I've added some currency formatting here. Notice that the negative um, values are not formatted and nor are the zero values. So they wouldn't actually display if we put this up in a label. Um, and so the opposite down below, only negative number formatting has been applied here in this example. And so positive and zero values would actually not display. And so to, dynamic, to dynamically apply color, what I did is I created two copies of my measure. In this case, it was year over year change. And to one copy, I added only positive number formatting. To the other copy, I added only a negative number format. And then I placed the two measures side by side, and then I added the colors that is appropriate. Um, so notice in this example, if we were to actually uh, look at this, the zero, any zero values would not display in the year over year change at the bottom, but you could always add that into the formatting or you could add an additional measure uh, depending on how you want your zeros to display in your data. And so this is um, basically the final product. So in this top, we see text formatting, symbols, and then also percent and decimal that you can add in. This In this bottom one, we see text, symbols, and then currency. And then finally, in this bottom one, we, I added a friendly ghost for fun. So I figured out that um, it looks like you can pull in other uh, unique symbols from Sego UI symbols font. Um, now, it pulled it in just fine in a desktop. I don't know what it looks like in a production environment, but um, yeah, you could have fun playing around with that. And so uh, uh, one, a quick tip. So when you're applying a color in combination with the custom number formats, remember that a decrease isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? So we want to think carefully about how we use color in these instances and ensure that our colors are ma matching the context. So in this example, total returns you know, total order returns from a business perspective, those decreasing from year over year is probably a good thing. And then finally, when you're displaying differences with respect to percentages, um, you want to think about how the user will interpret the data that is being presented. You know, what are your intentions? Do you intend to show percent change or percentage point change, which is more appropriate for your data and audience? And finally, how do you communicate that to the user? So um, you can find more about that in um, Tableau's uh, documentation. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jennifer. Sorry about my technical issues as well. I had um, plenty of them. Yeah, I, I feel like it's just a ghost in the machine type thing or something. I don't really know. Our, our Zoom is haunted today. Um, so last few slides before we wrap up. Um, we've got some bonus tips. Uh, the first one is learning your account executive's name. Um, I'm going to show, there we go. Oop. All right. Um, this is a map of the regions that I got from uh, the VP for Education um, last week. They are still hiring for a Midwest uh, uh, rep, but these are your, your uh, you know, all of our account execs. So account execs, part of their role is yes to sell, sell, sell. But one of the really nice things um, that they can do is also help you figure out how other schools have done things. And, you know, I love the data fan community. This community, the, the AT Tech community is really great too. You know, as you guys have seen, people are just share like any, anything and everything. Uh, and you can hear, you can learn all sorts of like little tips and tricks and also learn really big things um, just by going to our Slack space, going to this tug or other tug looking at the community forums, YouTube, all of those things. Um, but Tableau actually has staff who are there to help you succeed in using the tool because otherwise people wouldn't really use it all that often. Uh, and they're part of their job is to help you use it more efficiently. Um, so my my account exec is Denise. She um, is in the Northeast and New York and I think 
yes, Northeastern New York. I can read a map, really, I can. Um, she's only been at Tableau for about a year. Um, so she's relatively new and she's not really familiar with, or at least she's been, you know, learning more and more about how the different functions in Tableau work. Um, but one of the greatest things that she's been able to help us with is help, help us connect um, to make our internal tug at MIT work a little bit better. So I first met her probably about eight months ago. Um, it was right after I had, I had switched to a new role at MIT. And since then, um, our internal tug has scheduled about four, I think, um, MIT tech sessions, and she's helped with a couple of them. Um, so she coordinated to have a sales engineer um, host an Ask Me Anything session at one of one of our meetings. Um, and we basically peppered, peppered him with, with questions for half an hour and it was great. And there was nothing that we had to do other than saying, hey, here's the link and make sure that link actually works for external users. Um, our, our prior uh, account exec had also put me in touch with someone at Tableau who had worked with other people who had set up internal tugs in university contexts. And so that, uh, that, that person was able to um, you know, show me here's here's some sort of uh, here's here's some folks who have who have just started their internal tugs and here's what they're thinking and also here's some folks who have had internal tugs going forever and ever and have made that switch successfully to the virtual world um, and so it was great to have, sort of have that tug inspiration but also have like have a here's what's realistic like don't try to do a meeting every month for your internal tug most only do you know a quarterly meeting or or you know every couple months and so that really helped us sort of set expectations um especially when we weren't really sure where to start and it was one of those you know as much as the the slack space is great everyone has has a little bit of, of hesitancy of of, of 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 you know putting stupid questions out there um i i think i've since gone gotten over that but you know two years ago i wasn't over it yet so um, so learning my account exec sort of helped me learn, uh, you know, what else Tableau can offer us um, just to help us work better. Um, the next tip or trick or treat, another bonus one, is that IronViz is happening. So IronViz, if you are not familiar with it, uh, is a fun way to build your Tableau and data skills. Um, it's a play on the on the name Iron Chef. If you guys have ever watched that TV show from, I don't know if it's still on. I, I don't get cable. Um, but basically, you know, you just you you build visualizations in in a very uh, short time period in front of a, a whole bunch of people, um, and in the finals, you even have a sous visitor, sort of like a sous chef, uh, to help you out with your final build. Um, give me one second, and I will throw a link in there for what Iron Viz is. Um, but we are currently in the qualifying round uh, or the general qualifiers for Iron Viz, um, and it runs from October. Uh, third, which was what a week and a day ago, all the way till Halloween. Ah, perfect theme. Um, this year's uh, qual uh, qualifier theme is games, and there's a whole bunch of def you know the definition of what counts as a game, what doesn't count as a game. Um, and tomorrow they're actually uh, hosting a webinar to sort of help you um, sort of think about what that theme means. Hear from people who have participated in the Iron Viz. Uh, we actually have a former Iron Viz winner um, in the HE Tag ranks, uh, Lisa Prescott. Sorry, Trescott, uh, I think she talked to us probably what a little under a year ago about her experiences, but she actually she ended up winning um, uh, in the 2021 uh, Iron Viz competition. Um, and uh, on that link that I just put in the chat, there's also uh, information about um, what the prizes are and all of that. So. Um, there is a cash prize involved, so it's not just all for, for fun and, you know, social media shares or whatever. Uh, you can tell I have no social media, <laughs> I'm like whatever whatever the word is. Um, but it's, it, you know, I've heard from people that it's a really great way to sort of build your skills um, in a fun way and sort of learn things that you may not be able to use at work, but then can apply back in other, uh, in other iterations. So a whole bunch about Iron Fizz and here we go. Jenny, I think this might be you. Or maybe it's not. I don't know. I've lost track. <laughs> it's all right. It is. So um, what's next? Tell us what you thought about today's meeting. We really do value your feedback and we do try to take what you uh, suggest and implement it in future meetings. Um, as Roshi said, Iron Viz submissions are due on October 31st and uh, there is still plenty of time to get an idea and get it going if you haven't already. Um, our next HE Tug meeting is on November 8th from 3 to 4.30 Eastern as usual. Uh, there is a link to go ahead and sign up for that meeting. 
At that meeting, we're going to meet a community member. Laura, I'm not even going to try and pronounce her last name. She's uh, a colleague of Roshni's. Um, Roshioli, might... like ravioli. Yes, that's right. You might that's remember her she... from a month or two ago when she did our, our um, tip and trick of the month. Um, and then my colleague, Amanda Harper, is going to be doing our tips and tricks next month, which is about, um, oh gosh, I just totally forgot. It is about automation. automation. Yes. And then we have one empty presentation slot between now and the end of the year, and that is, could be you. So if you do want to present in November or any other future meeting, go ahead and fill out this form, let us know, and uh, we'll go from there.